this is part three of lecture three so please look at the earlier parts before watching this video so this part is going to be talking about control of blood pressure again but here we're going to look at the physiological um, mechanisms or the main physiological control mechanisms and they're what's called the baroreceptor reflex and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system so let's start looking at, right, at the baroreceptor reflex and essentially what baroreceptors do is they signal your blood pressure to the central nervous system and it consists of cells that are in the arterial wall and they're found in the aortic arch in cells called the carotid bodies as well and they send they sense the blood pressure and they have afferent nerves afferent just means taking information to the central nervous system so they send information to the central nervous system and again i'm not going to go into too much detail but the cardiovascular centers in the brain alter the sympathetic innovation to the cardiovascular system now if you remember in the last part i told you the arteries are largely innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and are partially contracted so changing the amount that arteries contract can alter blood pressure by either increasing or decreasing stimulation it's also worth bearing in mind that the heart has sympathetic innervation and if the heart is stimulated by the sympathetic nerves it increases the heart rate and the force of contraction and what this means is that changes in the cardiac output or the total peripheral resistance as mediated by the sympathetic nervous system can adjust the blood pressure accordingly because if you remember the blood pressure is a function of the cardiac output and the total peripheral resistance just see the previous two parts of this lecture so what does this mean how does this work well if you remember your body wants to remain in homeostasis it wants to keep the blood pressure within what it believes to be its normal range you know, within that normal range that I talked about in part one now if there is an imbalance that upsets the blood pressure such as an increase in the blood pressure then that is an imbalance in the normal homeostasis of the body so when there's a increase in blood pressure those baroreceptors in the carotid sinuses and the aortic arch they recognize they record they sense that increase in blood pressure above the normal range they send remember they're connected to nerves they send impulses to the brain where they stimulate the cardio inhibitory center what this will do when there's an increase in blood pressure it will reduce the sympathetic impulses to the heart so what we're going to get there is we're going to get a reduction in heart rate and a reduction in contractility of the blood vessels as well because we're also going to decrease the rate of sympathetic impulses to the blood vessels so this gives us a reduction in heart rate and a dilation of the blood vessels so we're getting a reduction in cardiac output and we're getting a reduction in total peripheral resistance and this reduction in cardiac output and total peripheral resistance reduces the blood pressure and returns it back to its normal balance or its normal level Similarly, if we get a decrease in blood pressure, the baroreceptor reflex can also adjust for that. The process is exactly the same, but in opposite. Here, 
The decrease in pressure is again sensed by the baroreceptors, this time instructing the sympathetic areas in the brain to increase um, sympathetic drive to the arteries and to the heart, increasing total peripheral resistance and increasing cardiac output. That would increase blood pressure and return the blood pressure back to the normal range. So that's one mechanism for maintaining blood pressure based on sensing the cardiac, uh, uh, based on sensing the blood pressure and adjusting total peripheral resistance and cardiac output appropriately. And that's the baroreceptor reflex. The other major way of regulating your blood pressure is via the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and that is regulated largely by the kidney now you'll need to refer to lectures on the function of the kidney to understand these processes in more detail but it's worth bearing in mind that the kidney is very much associated with the cardiovascular system and changes in one affect the other so we've already mentioned in, in part one and two of this lecture that blood volume can affect the blood pressure and the kidney regulates the blood volume. It regulates the amount of water and salts in your body. And of course, blood volume is very affected by the fluid levels and the levels of electrolytes that are in your blood. So if you have high sodium levels or high sodium retention, for example, that leads to fluid retention as well. Now, if you remember from those lectures that you've had, the nephron, which I'm just indicating here, is the functional unit of the kidney. And the glomerulus is the part of the nephron which filters um, uh, blood from the cardiovascular system. Then the rest of the nephron is about um, reabsorbing water and reabsorbing uh, solutes such as salts back into the body and excreting those into the urine that are not required. So how does the renin angiotensin aldosterone system regulate blood volume and somewhat surprisingly total peripheral resistance because it does have an effect on total peripheral resistance. So this part of the diagram which I'm just circling here shows you what you would normally find in the textbook as a summary of the angiotensin uh, aldosterone system. I've just added in what the link is to the arterial system and regulation of blood pressure that way. So let's start and think about what the normal function of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is. So normally, <clears throat> if your body was to sense low sodium or low levels of sodium in the distal tubule of the nephron, what would happen is it would signal via the macular denser to the juxtaglomerular cells and that would tell those cells to release this enzyme called renin into the blood supply. Okay, so this is now circulating in the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. Renin's function in the blood is to convert a protein released by the liver called angiotensinogen. And renin converts angiotensinogen into, uh, into this protein angiotensin 1. Now angiotensin is quite important because on endothelial cells and particularly the endothelial cells in the lungs, it's often stated, I think that's not quite correct. It's just that there's a lot of endothelial cells in the lungs. Um, 
then there's this other enzyme on the surface of these cells called angiotensin converting enzyme. Now what angiotensin converting enzyme does is it converts this circulating in the blood angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 also circulates in the blood but when it comes into contact with cells in the kidney it will lead to increased secretion of aldosterone and that increased secretion of this hormone called aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption by the distal tubule so it corrects the low sodium that's normally being sensed but angiotensin 2 has other effects as well now, so this sodium reabsorption as well as retaining sodium would also retain fluid but angiotensin 2 has another effect on uh, on blood pressure in that circulating angiotensin 2 acts on the smooth muscle cells of the small arteries that control total peripheral resistance and it's a very potent vasoconstriction it constricts these muscles reducing the diameter of this small resistance arterioles increasing total peripheral resistance and therefore increasing blood pressure in that way as well so angiotensin 2 can actually increase blood pressure by two means retaining sodium and fluid and by increasing total peripheral peripheral resistance and it's more complicated than that as well because as well as sensing low sodium if the body senses low blood pressure or low blood volume it also releases renin into the bloodstream and therefore would produce angiotensin 2 and cause this constriction and sodium retention similarly stimulation of the kidney via the sympathetic nervous system or by drugs that act on the beta adrenal receptors in the kidney as well as some prostaglandins also releases renin and again would increase blood pressure by increasing total peripheral resistance as well as to some extent by increasing sodium retention and therefore fluid as well so as well as maintaining electrolyte levels the renin angiotensin aldosterone system also has a key factor in controlling blood pressure particularly over the long term so to summarize the blood flow is determined by the perfusion pre pre pressure i.e the difference between the pressure in the arteries and the veins and the resistance to blood flow put up by the um the the arteries uh, uh, largely the arterial system so blood pressure as we mentioned in part one is a measurement of the pressure in the circulatory system and it's dependent on blood volume and primarily on blood volume resistance to flow and the cardiac output resistance to flow is what i'm terming total peripheral resistance Therefore, total peripheral resistance is dependent on the contractile state of the arterial system and it is the endothelium that is largely responsible for relaxing these arteries, whereas the nervous system primarily constricts these arteries. But do remember they are partially constricted normally by the sympathetic nervous system, so reductions in the sympathetic nervous system, as seen with the baroreceptor reflex, can also lower the blood pressure. So the two main control mechanisms for blood pressure are the baroreceptor reflex and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And in fact, uh, the renal system in general for controlling blood uh, um, volume. And it's worth remembering that a lot of the drugs which uh, target the uh, high blood pressure actually work on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and how that interacts with the cardiovascular system finally just to put up 
a slide of the learning outcomes for, for this particular lecture. I'll just put some context into these learning uh, objectives that help um, meet some of the outcomes for the pharmacy degree.